Hi, my name is Professor Tom Solomon. I'm the president of the Encephalitis Society and I'm a neurologist working at the University of Liverpool and the Walton Neurocentre in Liverpool in the UK. Encephalitis is, is inflammation and swelling of the brain and in infectious encephalitis this is caused by an infection, uh, a bug, a microbe in the nervous system. That might be a bacteria or a virus or another infectious agent. One of the biggest groups are viruses which are transmitted by mosquitoes such as Japanese encephalitis or Zika virus or dengue virus and in those cases somebody's bitten by a mosquito the virus gets into the bloodstream and then crosses into the brain to cause encephalitis. Another group of infectious encephalitis are, are viruses which are not transmitted by mosquitoes or ticks but those which we get a natural infection with. So herpes is a very good example of this. Many humans become infected with herpes virus and it doesn't cause any problems at all or it just occasionally causes a cold sore. But in some unfortunate people the virus instead of just causing a cold sore goes right up into the brain and causes a cold sore on the brain and that's what herpes encephalitis is. There's another group of infectious encephalitis when it's a bacteria that's causing the problem. Usually it's a very small intracellular bacteria, something like a rickettsial bacteria, uh, for example scrub typhus, and again the bacteria gets into the nervous system and causes the inflammation and the swelling which is characteristic of encephalitis. In terms of the causes of encephalitis, a couple of other important causes are rabies, which of course is transmitted typically by the bite of a dog or the bite or scratch of another animal which is carrying the virus. One additional important cause is enteroviruses. Now polio is the, is the classic example of this, but this has mostly been eradicated now. But there are other related enteroviruses like enterovirus 71, which causes hand, foot and mouth disease. This is a disease with vesicles and rashes. Um, but also sometimes, again, the virus gets into the brain and causes encephalitis. Whatever the infectious cause is, uh, the symptoms usually begin with a fever or a febrile illness, a flu-like illness, and then after some days this is followed by either an alteration in consciousness, so a patient going into coma, sometimes there is strange behaviour, people may think that they are behaving oddly, sometimes it's a seizure, a convulsion, which, which tells us that there's something wrong with the brain itself. Additionally, there are sometimes other features like a, a very bad headache, uh, being troubled by noise and light, generally feeling unwell. All of these can be symptoms of encephalitis. But the key thing is that uh, it goes from being somebody who has a flu-like illness or a febrile illness. That could be any number of, of, of causes. But once there's a clue that the, that the virus is, or the bacteria is in the brain because somebody has strange behaviour or because they are reducing in their consciousness level, they're becoming unconscious, or because they're having a seizure, or maybe difficulty talking, those are clues that this is something more than just the flu. This is a brain infection, and this person needs to get to hospital as soon as possible. To diagnose encephalitis, the key investigation is the lumbar puncture. This is a spinal tap where a needle is put into the back to get some of the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that washes around the brain. And we can then look at this fluid, we can see is it abnormal, are there an abnormal number of white cells in the fluid which tells us there's some kind of inflammation. And then we can look in more detail and for example do a PCR which is a specific test to look for a specific viral or bacterial cause. And if that's positive then we've nailed it, we know exactly what the cause is. There are additional tests that many patients with encephalitis have. Uh, often we will do a brain scan and the brain scan can show us that there is inflammation and swelling in the brain and sometimes it's in a particular part of the brain and that may suggest a particular cause of encephalitis. So a lumbar puncture and a brain scan, those are the key tests and then often there are also blood tests, uh, there may be tests of the urine or the stool because sometimes there are clues there as to a specific cause. Unfortunately, for many causes of infectious encephalitis, there is no specific treatment. It very much depends what the cause is, what the virus or bacteria is that's causing the problem. 
if it's herpes simplex virus, which is a common sporadic cause of encephalitis, then there is treatment. There's acyclovir treatment. This is an antiviral drug we give intravenously, and this has been shown to be very effective in controlling encephalitis caused by herpes simplex virus. If it's a bacterial cause like scrub typhus, then again, there are antibiotic uh, drugs, antibacterial drugs. But for many causes, for the mosquito-borne causes like Japanese encephalitis and Zika and dengue and West Nile virus, unfortunately, we don't have an antiviral drug uh, that we can use to treat this condition. So in addition to uh, vaccination against Japanese encephalitis and rabies, there's also vaccination against measles. We have a very good vaccine for measles, and yet measles uh, is one of the causes of viral encephalitis. So it's really important that people use the vaccines that are available, and I, I very strongly believe in, in the use of vaccines to prevent encephalitis. The other important aspect of treatment, once somebody is over the acute phase, once they're over that very short period where they're very sick for a, a few days or a few weeks, is rehabilitation. We need to get them back into the community that they came from. We need to support them if they're having language problems. We need to support any physical problems. So uh, rehabilitation is a very important part of the treatment of encephalitis overall. Unfortunately, the outcome of encephalitis is, is, is often not good. It depends a little bit on the cause, but broadly speaking, uh, from 10 to 20 percent of patients will sadly die from encephalitis and those that survive uh, among them there will be a high number who have complications uh, or sequelae. Sometimes these are very obvious physical things but sometimes actually a patient will look completely normal. They look like they've recovered but actually they've not recovered mentally and in terms of their cognitive function. There may be behavioral changes, there may be memory problems, there may be other problems with the, the way the mind's working. And that can be a, a real challenge because to all the world this looks like somebody who has completely recovered from their illness, but actually they've not completely recovered and they, they still need help. And this is one of the areas where the Encephalitis Society plays such a big role in providing information to families and also support uh, so that they can maximise their chance of a good recovery. And of course some patients with encephalitis do recover completely, which uh, is a very positive message.